This episode of Rules of Success is brought to you in part by Brahma Lending. I have a question for you. Does your business need money? Whether to raise working capital, purchase new equipment, finance your accounts receivable, or even acquire a new company, Brahma Lending can help. Unlike a bank or a local credit union that lend based on creditworthiness, Brahma has relationships with dozens of lenders throughout the United States that can offer both traditional and non-traditional solutions. What does that mean for you? Options. To see how Brahma can help you and your business, take a minute and visit morelendingoptions.com. This episode of Rules of Success is also brought to you in part by Gnarly Nutrition. It could be argued that diet and supplementation are actually more important to a fit, healthy body than actual exercise. That's where Gnarly Nutrition steps in. With products that include BCAAs, whey protein, pre-workout powders, and meal replacements, Gnarly is committed to providing clean sports nutrition, period. You can be confident that Gnarly Nutrition products are blended with only superior, organic, non-GMO ingredients. With Gnarly, it's natural, healthy, and delicious. Go check out GoGnarly.com to get your stash. From a very early age, I was kind of always able to assess the situation. They teach you in uh, blackjack that you're supposed to play the dealer's hand, not your own hand. And and I kind of, you know, I did that in terms of, of, of life or whether it was school or activity I was getting involved in. And I, I immediately kind of am aware of the room that I'm walking into and sort of how how to go about it. I always find it funny when, when you hear people talking about We'll teach you our sales techniques. And, and, and in my mind, I'm like, it's all kind of bullshit because this, the same technique does not work on all all of your potential clients. You know, it's you have to know your client. To me, you know, being aware of your surroundings and, and who you're talking to, I think is, is equally as important as anything on the IQ scale. Welcome back. Friends, family, trusted associates, members of Success Nation, thank you for joining me on another full-length episode. That voice you just heard is a man by the name of Turney Duff. Turney is a New York Times best-selling author of the book, The Buy Side. Some of the other bylines on his resume include he currently is a consultant for the television show Billions on Showtime. He's a contributor for CNBC. He writes articles for CNBC and other uh, outlets along the way. He's ghostwritten a book. He's in development for another book as well basically professional author. The buy side, though, his uh, most uh, famous book is his personal tale of when he was a Wall Street trader and uh, his experience from starting on the ground floor and how he ended up being a co-founder of a billion dollar hedge fund. It's a fascinating read. I, I was able to read it before the interview and I'll have some links in the show notes on where to go find it. Anyway, this conversation with Turney is really quite interesting because we talk about all of the different things that come up when you start to succeed financially and when when finances stop being the obstacle of what you want to do. His, he shares about his creative process, what he did to actually as a, as a way to come to terms with things and, and how he wrote the buy side and how he decided to just stop trying to you know, please everybody. He was not trying to impress anyone when it came to you know, his personal uh, issues and just wrote as honest of a tale as he could remember. And the result is this really fascinating look into Wall Street during that time. I'm going to read to you a quote from him. He says, It would take nearly a complete disaster in my life, self-inflicted by city lights and fondness of cocaine, for me to turn back to the page. But it took what it takes, and I'm grateful it did. Now, I'm right back where I started with a month's rent saved up and an empty computer screen in front of me, and I couldn't be happier. Oh, yes, I could, and am, when I'm with my eight-year-old daughter, Lola. Anyway, we discuss with Turney his illustrious background, his creative process, his motivations, and all of the things that he's been doing to bring a different perspective to the people that uh, associate with his content. Anyway, let's get started right after this intro. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Rules of Success. We discuss the topics that help you see things in a different way. We talk balance in body, being, business, and relationships. A podcast about success? Yeah, that's us. Here's your host, Bryce Prescott. All right, my friends, family, trusted associates, welcome back to another full-length episode. I have to be, full disclosure, I'm really, really excited for this episode. I've got Turney Duff with me, author of the book, The Buy Side, former Wall Street trader, and uh, now you find yourself doing all sorts of fun stuff, it seems, consulting for billions, (laughs) you write for CNBC, 
do a little on-air work there. With how's, how's it going, Tony? Thanks for coming to the show. It's it's good. Thank you uh, for having me. I'm uh, I'm excited to do this. Me too, man. I uh, this this is kind of a slam a slam bam type of deal for me. We just arranged this in the last couple days, and uh, the irony of it being so quickly put together is that this is one of the most prepared interviews that I've ever had. I. Wait found out about your stuff from a close friend of mine, Ever Gonzalez, and he was the one that made the, the introduction and dove right in, just started digging into your career and your book. And, and I, fascinating stuff, man. Like seriously, right, this right. is great. Shouldn't, shouldn't you tell them that uh, you found me on Craigslist? <laughs> it was a missed encounter. There was that <laughs> yes. one time that- <laughs> uh, That's so exactly Bryce what and I met on uh, Craigslist. Yeah, we, we, we met on Craigslist. It was a it was a drunken evening one night in a speakeasy in Philadelphia. Yes, exactly. <laughs> no, but thanks again, man. This is this is great. You know, I, I've always been uh, really curious about that life. You know, my my uh, my upbringing was you know I was from the Pacific Northwest. I've lived here in Salt Lake City, Utah, for a big chunk of my adult life, and so the the shine and lure of New York City and and being a Wall Street trader and that whole thing has always been really interesting to me. So I'm I'm curious. I'm excited to talk to you about it and and see how it turned out. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Well, and and, and uh, nothing's off limits. Okay. Well, that's that's good to know, man. Because uh, you know, having read your book, uh, it, you adopted that idea when you shared everything. I mean, it's very candid, very open about things that sometimes are uncomfortable for people to know, but it uh, it plays. And uh, you wrote a great book. I'll, I'll give you. links and everything to the show notes of where people can find it and and uh, buy it because you'll you'll want to go out and get it after listening to this. I'm sure. Let's uh let's talk about you as a as a person heading into this though. Um, before we jump into that though, I wanted to give you a chance to describe exactly what is your book, The Buy Side. Give us your elevator pitch for that. Sure. Um, you know, it's, it can be described in a number of ways. You know, you, you could call it, um, you know, a, a, a Wall Street um, biography. You could, you could call it an addiction memoir. But what I think it ultimately ends up becoming is a coming of age story but but with the caveat, I, you know, when I started writing, uh, I didn't have an intention. I didn't say I'm going to write this. Uh, my my only intentions were, you know, for it to be pure, for it to be honest, and for it to be raw. So I wasn't I wasn't trying to lead the audience in in any direction uh, per se. Um, but I but I really think it ended up turning into a coming of age story because. Um, you know, my, my, my path or, you know, fake would have been different if I'd chosen a different profession, but I don't think a lot of my problems and issues, uh, would have went away. You know, they would have followed me regardless of, of what path I chose. So, um, you know, it's, it's about a guy who just happened to work, uh, on wall street and just happened to work during the 15 most dramatic years in the history of finance and just happened to work at a hedge fund that is considered infamous. And my former boss is serving one of the longest sentences in the history of wall street. So for insider trading, um, but those are all just kind of details, I believe of, 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 of a kid who, who moved to the city and, and, and had big dreams and wanted, wanted, you know, to, to, to make it big. And, and, and he kind of figured out how to do that and sacrifice some things along the way and ended up going too deep. And, you know, I was halfway down the rabbit hole before I even, even knew what was going on. I, I, I'd, uh, I'd like to, you couldn't have teed this up for me more, <laughs> more better. The, I want to read a quote from your book that really stuck out for me when you know, in, in the process of storytelling, this is something I'm, I'm sure you're all too familiar with. There's there's times where you recount events, but then there's there's positions between the recounting of those events where where we sometimes pontificate about what's going on and some of the deeper meaning. And there's lessons that we can share throughout, you know, patching those together. And in your book, you have this. I'll just I'll read it. Quote here. It says in most Wall Street careers, there are lines drawn and then erased. Greed and power are maybe the biggest erasers. But there are also subtler reasons for lowering standards. The wife wants to move to a bigger house. The kids are about to go to college. You're having an affair with the girl in the intern program, all of which means you need more money. And the line you thought you'd never cross doesn't seem so uncrossable anymore. I understand that. But I also know that no matter where my career goes, I never put myself in a position where people hate me. I'll quit before that happens. 
when I hear you recount kind of the you know cautionary tale and the story of you know 15 years of of uh, working in finance, which just so happened to be historically some of the craziest, I I love that in your book that you point that out that we all start our careers and our we have points in our life where we think there's lines we won't cross, and then shit gets real and we tend to cross them sometimes. Yeah. Um, at what point did you realize that you, that line was pliable for you? You know, it, it, it's, it's, uh, it's easier to answer, um, you know, kind of looking back in hindsight versus in the moment, I don't know if I could have ever pinpointed, you know, and said, this is it. O- other than, you know, the first time I did cocaine, I knew it was going to be a problem eventually because it was so good. Um, but I could have never imagined, you know, where where I ended up. But, um, you know, and, and the, the bigger question or more specifically what what you're asking, you know, when I when I look back and and kind of see the two years I was at Galleon, you know, I was, uh, you know, 30, 31, 32 years old and or 30, 31 years, 29. Yeah, I was, it was right in there. And, you know, all of a sudden, you know, it, it just my my views shifted, you know, and, and I don't, I don't want to waste too much time, but just like a quick short anecdote I can share with you. Um, after a very, very huge day at Galleon, we made like, I don't know, something like 40 or 50 million dollars one day. I hopped on a plane, um, flew up to Boston, then drove up to uh, Kennebunk, Maine, where I where I grew up, you know, very small town on the coast of Maine. And, and I ended up going out with these two girls that I went to high school with. And we were, you know, just in the car driving to the bar. And they were they were chatting about uh, one of our classmates. And they're like, oh, you know, have you did you, did you hear about Tommy? Oh, my God, he's doing so well. And, um, you know, I, I should actually be doing like main accents right now. But, um, <laughs> uh, you know, like we, we were in the car. And um, so... You know, they, they were going on and on about this guy, Tommy, and they're like, oh, my God, he's so successful, blah, 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 blah. And from the back seat, I just go, oh, I'm like, does he make a million dollars a year? And and they, and they like kind of looked back, but like they thought I was joking and I wasn't. And they kept going on. And then they're like, yeah, and he, he makes like sixty thousand dollars a year. And and I was just sitting in that back seat looking out the window going to be like, I'm I'm not uh, <laughs> I'm not the person I was. Uh, you know, when I graduated high school, um, and, 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 and I, I remember that kind of being a moment where everything had already shifted, uh, my views of, you know, wealth and success and what was important had already kind of morphed and, and, and that's not blaming Wall Street or, or, or anyone like it's, it's, I was living in New York and that, that is kind of how how I believed at the, at the time, but like, you know, it it was moments like that where you could, you could see a a definite uh, difference between, you know, 18 year old tourney and 28 year old tourney, you know, like I, I I could see a dramatic shift. And of course we all change and, and we grow up and we mature and hopefully for the better. Um, So you know, to, to say that there shouldn't be any differences is is not right. Um, but maybe when they're so dramatic, um, you should maybe take a step back. I don't know. No, I, I, I identify with that answer in a lot of ways. There's there's a you, for, for you're, you're not that familiar with my show yet. And so to give you a little bit of a backstory about this, I. I had a pretty, it's interesting to read your account of what happened, you know, during, during the crash 2008 and, you know, all of the, the mortgage backed securities and CDOs and right. everything that was going on there. My, I actually had a, a real estate firm that I had founded with a partner in uh, June of 2008, where we were going on the other side of that and we were gobbling up and buying post foreclosed homes. And then we were going and repurposing them using a seller finance model and, and putting people back into them. And, we had a really, really good run for about three and a half years before the law changed and banks weren't required to dump their stuff the way they were. And, you know, now you were seeing these large um, losses of uh, on bank books be able to be sold individually instead of having to, you know, be turned over to the FDIC and be, you know, right. sold out to the market in bulk. And 
before that uh, time I was in mortgages. And, and so, you know, I thought making 200 grand a year was a great year. And, you know, especially here in, in Utah where the cost of living is lower and stuff and, and to go it, from, it from, is a great year. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> it's funny. Cause now that that life is gone, you know, I, we don't have this, we don't have similar stories as far as like what we did, but I found threads that I really identified with, with how, you know, different things you experienced with both, you know, wealth and personal issues and addictions and different things that were really, really, really curious to me. And, and I, I found connection there with them. You know, when we started that company, it didn't take us but four or five months to close our first deal. And we had a, you know, several year run where we had, I won't give numbers as far as finances, but you know, we had bought and sold, you know, close to 8,000 properties over the course of that time. Wow. And it was, it was really, really lucrative for us. And to go in such a short period of time from, you know, a dwindling mortgage book of business that I was working on as a broker to being, this guy that you know, I didn't have, I didn't have money problems. My problem was I had too much money. Um, right. All of a sudden, all of these things start to come to play, and like you've described in your book, that you never have to worry about. You don't look at price tags. You do different things, and all of a sudden, I found that the the, the demons that had been hidden by not having the money to live them out, all of a sudden, had a way out, and it was very interesting. Yeah. Um, so that's that's one of the reasons why I identified so much with that that specific paragraph from your book that I read. It's because like when I look back at some of the things that happened. I never would have allowed that to happen before, but you know, that line is in the sand and the water comes up and kind of erases it and you don't realize where your line is. And then you cross a line you didn't think you had and right. you know, just, it just becomes this interesting thing. Um, um, I'm sorry. Well, just, ju- just to jump on that, um, you know, an- another very common theme throughout my life is um, I've always kind of lived in this if then universe. Sure. And, um, you know, when, when I first started Morgan Stanley, I was making $22,000 a year. And I, re- I remember distinctly saying to my friends, you know, whether I was at the bar or at my apartment, I said, you know, if, if, if I just made $50,000 a year, all of my problems would be solved. And, and guess what? You know, fast forward seven years, I'm in my 9,300 square foot, you know, triplex apartment in Tribeca, you know, lying on my $5,000 couch saying, you know, I just made two million bucks. I'm like, if I just made three million dollars, you know, all of my problems would would be would be solved. You know, <laughs> right, so yeah. it was always if if X happens, then I'll feel Y, and and it never ever happened. Well, that that to me is one of those interesting parts of the human condition. We have a really difficult time being content with yes. what's going on now. And especially in kind of the entrepreneurial world where, you know, there's goals and you have, you have targets and metrics are using to, to measure how well you're doing. And money is always a key metric, you know, how much, how profitable you are. That dance of being willing and able to be okay with where you're at now, but yet still want to, to stretch yourself and expand is, is a very difficult one for a lot of people. I, I, I think most people don't understand really how to do that. They're either <laughs> content and they don't give a shit about goals or they're always in tomorrow land. Like they can't yeah. really be happy today. They're, they're giving up that real estate in their head to, to tomorrow. It's, it's, it's a tough balance. Yeah. So let's, let's back up a couple of years. So Knowing what I've known from reading your book, I, I want to hear your specific take on this as far as your childhood. You, you seem like a really natural salesman. You're obviously great with storytelling and words with, with the books that you've written. How is that turny? How, how were you affected as a kid? There's, there's this, this uh, you know, conversation that happens about nature versus nurture. You came that way or you were in an environment that allowed you to, to be nurtured into a specific type of person. You being somewhat of a hustler and a sales guy, where do you fall in that line, and how does that r- relate to your, you know, your parents and your siblings and the different things that that were a part of you growing up in Maine? Um, you know, it, it's great question, um, and I don't know if I have the 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 right answer, but uh, There's my, no wrong my answer opinion, here. <laughs> my opinion, um, I don't know, you know, nature versus nurture, you know, probably a combination, but you know, I always saw myself as, you know. I was a B student, right? Um, I I was social and 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 I had friends and I loved playing sports and you know I just kind of bebopped around. Um, but I was a B student, and if if, if I was ever going to move the needle, um, I had to I had to approach things differently. Um, either A because I wasn't willing to to put in the extra time to to study, or B I just I didn't think think I was capable. Um, so 
from a very early age, I was kind of always able to assess the situation. Um, you know, like they teach you in uh, blackjack when you when you first start playing blackjack. You know that you're supposed to play uh, the dealer's hand, not your own hand. Sure, yeah. And 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 I kind of you know I did that in terms of 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 life or whether it was school or or whatever you know whatever activity I was I was kind of getting getting involved in and. Um, you know, another thing that was extremely helpful to me growing up, entering the workforce, and then, you know, once I was in the workforce, is the whole, the, uh, the whole idea of IQ versus EQ. Um, I don't know what, what my IQ is, um, but I'm, my guess is that my EQ is probably a lot higher than my IQ. Um, I have the ability to walk into a conference room and I can immediately tell you what the temperature is. I can say, you know, internally in my head, oh, you, you need to be funny or oh, this is, you know, strictly business, be serious or, you know, focus your energy on this person or, or, or whatever it is. But like I, I immediately kind of am aware of the room that I'm walking into and sort of how how to go about it. And, you know, it's, I always find it funny when when you hear people talking about we'll teach you our sales techniques and, you know, Blah, 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 blah. And, and in my mind, I'm like, it's all kind of bullshit because this, the same technique does not work on all, you know, all of your potential clients. You know, it's it's you have to know your client and, um, you know, yeah. Can you learn something from, you know, a seminar or, you know, a, a class? I'm, I'm sure you can. But uh, to me, you know, being aware of your surroundings and, and who you're talking to um I think is is equally as important as anything on the IQ scale. And, you know, I, I remember, you know, I'd be on the trading desk and I'd be sitting next to a guy and he'd go into the boss's office and say, hey, I, I you know, I need I need Friday off. And, and I'd look at him and just be like, like are you dumb? Like <laughs> it's it's Tuesday. We're down twenty five million dollars. Everything is red on our screen everyone's in a terrible mood like that is not when you ask if you can have friday off you know what i mean so you know it it's timing you know there, there's so many elements involved in all decisions that you make you know some sometimes it's not what the question that that you ask is it's but when you ask it um you know and 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 i'm sorry i'm going off on a tangent but like you know look if 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 you need a favor for me I would much rather you come up if, if we have an established relationship. Let's say we've known each other for a real long time. Then you know what? Cut to the chase. Call me up. I don't care. We haven't spoke for six months. Ask me the favor. Don't do the twenty-five minutes of oh, how's your daughter and what's going on with this and and then the last five minutes of the phone call. Oh, and by the way, can you do this for me? Like total turnoff. If you don't know me, don't don't you know come in guns blazing and be like I need a favor. But come in and, and try to establish a relationship. And, you know, I'm not saying you need to get to know me, but like let's let's get some common ground before you, you ask a favor. So, you know, it it's always different depending on the relationship and 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 what you're asking. But like there there, there needs to be thought put into uh when when you're asking for a favor or advice or or whatever it is. I love that you bring that up because it's something that I've been noticing in in the the circles that I run in being being an entrepreneur and a small business owner and and a, a podcast host obviously there there is that kind of favor economy that comes and right. there is something to be said for understanding the mindset of timing and that there's a there's a right time to do and to present certain ways I I think unfortunately a lot of times people nowadays they really forget that it's actually beneficial to put yourself in the position of the other person every now and then just as an exercise of perspective. Right. And then by doing that, you can actually gain favor in a way that is unspoken. Really. I, I, I love you talked about that same thing in your book about, you know, that example of when you're, you know, it's, you ask for Friday as a day off and you're down on Tuesday. Like that's the dumbest thing ever. Like there's a way right. to finagle it so that you can actually 
create asking for that favor to be a win for you and for them, you know, and to have right. it be a, a, a mutually beneficial deal. Right. And all that is just, you know, planning and awareness. It's it's not yep. rocket science. And and the other thing I would add to that is, um, and, and this is something I've, I've been kind of doing my whole life, um, whether, you know, you read my book and you end up thinking, you know, I was a bad guy, you know, whatever your opinion of me is, that's fine. Um, but I started off as a good guy. And, you know, I always, I tried to help other people, you know, and I would look around the, the floor at, at Morgan Stanley, because there was like 300 people on it. And I would see other, other people my age doing what I would call like target networking. Like, you know, they would pick a guy in a corner office and they would say to themselves, oh, he's going to be able to help me with my career. I'm going to suck up to him. And they would focus all their energy on trying to network with this one person. And I just, I never subscribed to that. You know, I was going to be nice to, you know, the guy, the the taxi guy who, who got me to work and the people in the mail room, the big boss, the big, big boss, you know, my peers. And I was just going to try to be nice and, and help people when I could. Um, and not for a direct, you know, sort of payback, as 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 you mentioned, which which I, I definitely agree in the favor economy. Um, but just kind of this idea that if, if if I put good positive energy out to the universe and and I do help other people, it will come back to me. And it's funny because throughout my career, people who were lower uh, on the totem pole than me at the time of me helping you know, skyrocketed, you know, two, three, five years later, and we're in very powerful positions. And guess what? Like, I was the guy because, yeah. you know, like I treated them a certain way when they were an assistant. See, so. that's powerful, man. And that's a great example to, to if, you know, if, as people listen to this show, that's something to, to be remembered there that kindness can go a long way, even when you don't, if, if you have a, an agenda to your kindness, you're already behind that. You're already 100%. missing the point. Very well said. You uh, you referenced something that I want to dive into a little before. You said, you know, when I give positive, you know, energy into the universe, it comes back to me. That type of uh, verbiage and is is synonymous with a, a lot of this kind of self development, self help talk, and and uh, law of attraction type stuff. And and to to strip away some of the tree huggerness of that. <laughs> there, there is some some important things to, to glean from it. And one of them is that having a mindset that thinks and feels that, you know, we're actually in a friendly universe, that we're in a good place, and that by doing what's right and by giving goodness to those around us, it comes back to us. And that there's an even further step with that when it comes to success and, and achievement, that by believing and, and knowing that ultimately we will succeed by acting upon inspired thought by knowing what our target is first and foremost if you don't have a target you don't know where we're going to end up so by by planning where you want to go and then having there be a, a grateful understanding you're going to get there someday that that you will so specific to you and in, in your career and your life have you is that something that you adopt and have subscribed to and, and, and if it's not or if it is it, it's really irrelevant but I, I want to follow up that question to be how have you noticed or not noticed that affect the achievement results you've experienced um you know I, I i definitely subscribe to it um you know i i kind of liken it i guess a little to you know fishing with a net versus with a, with a pole sure. um look I, bryce i've i've been burned um i've been taken advantage of it's gonna happen again um you know in in the future of course like it's in it's inevitable um but I can't allow that fear um, to to you know kind of push back and and change who who I want to be, whether it be just as a person or in business. And you know, so I'm not coming to the table, you know, with this with this idea that you can't you can't get one on over on me, or you know, I have to win every battle. Um, so. So by by kind of removing that fear of 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 always having to win or always having to be right or or whatever it is, and um, trying to do good work, trying to trying to help other people, um, has put me in a position. Whether you want to talk Wall Street, writing my book, 
doing stuff on TV. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's put me in a better position. Like I'll give you an example. Um, my book was optioned by Sony in 2013. Uh, they ended up sitting on it for, for a while. Um, and then they attached a, a brilliant director, producer, a writer, um, a, a guy named Selden jo- um, Turner who had a golden globe for up in the air. And, and like, they put an all-star team together and all of a sudden um, it became kind of a horse race between uh, billions, my book. Um, and, and there were a couple of other books and, and Jordan Belfort was talking about maybe doing something in TV and it kind of became this horse race and, and Showtime ended up uh, picking up and, and buying billions. And, um, you know, I was very disappointed. I was, you know, I, I thought my, my book was going to become a, a, a big hit TV show and I was so excited and, and now it was all taken away. And I, I made a choice. I said, you know, I can, I can sit here and, and pout and be angry and upset. And I, I said, or I can, I can root for the other team. And, and I ended up, uh, with, with zero intentions, but I ended up kind of reaching out to the two, um, executive producers who, uh, you know, I I kind of knew friends of friends and, um, you know, started following one of them on Twitter and he followed me back. And then all of a sudden we started, you know, uh, they had me over for coffee and very friendly chat and kind of left it at that. And then, you know, six months later, um, they, they, they hired me as a consultant. And the only reason I got hired as a consultant was because I made the choice that I was going to be positive, yet I was disappointed with my own results. Um, and then I ended up making, you know, great, great connection and relationships. And I worked on season one and, and it was all because I chose, I chose to be positive. Well, I was going to ask you about this in the second segment, but you're kicking this door open. I, I want to know more about that consulting gig that you've got. I, I told you before off air, that's one of my favorite shows on TV, man. And to know you're involved is kind of cool for me. <laughs> one degree of separation to some guy that has influence into that show. That's pretty cool. How did, so you've, you've shared how you got that gig based off of um, an interesting way that you've defined success or failure. In, in, in your mind, you didn't get the gig you wanted because they didn't option your book further to, to be a television show. But yet, if you look at it from, as you, you use your own words, from, you know, you were fishing with a net instead of a pole, you still won based off of that because it put you in the room, so to speak, with people that uh, were in your same boat, and and now you're you're on that show. T- tell me about what what exactly do you do for billions? Um, I can't talk too much about the show, um, like the the process and all of that. Okay. Um, they they would prefer that you know kind of stayed um, from from their their side of the table. Okay, um, but amazing amazing group of people, the executive producers phenomenal the writers room is phenomenal the actors um literally my 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 job really only entails um making it authentic when it when when it needs to be um but i i have to say they they do such a phenomenal job and and the accuracy is placed at at uh you know at a, at a premium it's paramount for them um to to do a true true wall street hedge fund depiction um so you know i'm i'm just involved on the fringe um and you know i i will take a look at some things and and say hey maybe maybe he should say this or but you know it's it's not it's not a big role okay fair enough i i I like that that's an important part of uh, the show though because sometimes the things i mean I've, i've seen every episode of season one and there's some pretty crazy stuff that goes on in that show. And so to think that, you know, they got to run that by the pros and make sure that could fly. That's exciting to think it's scary at the same time, but it's exciting. Um, yeah, there, there, yeah, there were some days where I'm like, Oh my God. Oh my God. Like I knew it was right, but like, <laughs> you're still like, Oh my God. Oh my God. That's great. Aaron, let's see now. Aaron Sorkin's a part of that. Uh, gig Andrew, well, right? Andrew, Andrew Sorkin. Sorkin. That's right. Not right. Aaron. Andrew. He, he's the one that wrote the book. Was it too big to too fail? Too big to fail. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. He's uh Got an all-star team there, man. That's great. Well, let's let's jump back more into your mindset and, and the way that you are. Um, I I came to this realization not too long ago that seemed pretty um, mind blowing for me when I reviewed my my life and the different decisions that I've made. Um, just real quick, as a this is more for you than the listeners of the show. They've already seen this, but you know when when things 
things went south pretty quickly. It was a pretty spectacular crash when uh, when my real estate career after we were doing the REOs and everything collapsed in 2012. Um, found myself with uh, you know a little, little scare of cancer. I was completely broke, had relationship issues. I was fucking fat and out of shape. I mean, my, my life was basically just a, a shell of what it once was. And I realized this simple thing that when you focus on money in your life and your pursuits, you get it but you don't get anything else. When you focus on everything else, if you do it right, you get all of that and you have opportunities to make money. And that came to me from being exposed to some certain books and mentors and just different people that were helping me in a coaching capacity to, to look past the metric of money as being the only way to measure whether I've done it right or not. And it was really transformational for me because I started realizing that like, you know, if, if I make a little bit less money every year, but yet I have time to hang out with my kids and I've got, you know, the, I, I could take my wife on a date once a week and, and court her as she deserves and, and provide her what she needs. And, and I have time to focus on my own fitness and things that all of a sudden, like the bigger picture of life becomes a lot more fulfilling and complete. So sharing that little bit with you, I, I wanted to know what has been some of the things you've been exposed to. What are some of the authors that have been most impactful for you? Have you, have you had mentors that have made a difference for you throughout the transition of, of getting out of wall street and then into uh, TV and being a, a professional writer? How has that transition been for you and who have been people that have helped you along the way? Um, you know, it's, uh, that that's, thank you for sharing that. And, um, professionally, um, you know, I, I, I have, uh, people that, that, that I look up to, but in terms of what kind of you were sharing, I really gained that from, um, getting, getting sober and, and sort of the, uh, the fellowship and, and, and being in recovery. And I couldn't agree with you more, um, in terms of, you know, I focused on the money and, and the way I describe it is I chased happiness for, for you know most of my life but for definitely for 15 years on wall street and you know i was sitting in my apartment uh in long island city it was like 2000 and 2012 maybe and it was late at night and i'm sitting there and um i'd been sober for about two years uh all of my amends had gone flawlessly i had just gotten a huge book deal from Random House. Uh, I was getting along great with my ex. I was seeing or talking to my daughter every day. And I was sitting there and, and I was like, I'm I'm not happy. And and I was like, I'm I'm an asshole. Like something is seriously wrong with me. I I'll never be happy. And um so I go to, I went to the computer and I looked up the definition of happiness from the Declaration of Independence in 1776, because I wanted to know, you know, the most famous line is in the pursuit of happiness. Sure. And, and one thing I, I learned was that happiness back then meant honor, meant integrity, it meant how you lived your life. And somewhere along the way, you know, whether it was me or, uh, you know, our generation or, or what, um, I was equating happiness to pleasure, um, to material things. Um, and and in that moment, I said, you know what? Fuck happiness. I don't want to be happy. I don't. I don't care about being happy. And I made my goal on that day um, was serenity. And and I know it sounds a little, you know, hokey or whatever, but that's that's what I did. And I said, you know, serenity is now my goal. And and I believed that uh, serenity is something that can be sustained, whereas happiness stuff comes and goes and you know once once you get a promotion that that high is only gonna last for a little while so i never thought happiness was was something that could be sustained and so the the irony in all this is the the day that i said fuck happiness i don't want to be happy I, I i just want serenity is the day where uh you know i've i've never been happier uh you know from from that moment forward so um I I I definitely agree with with everything that you said and and um you know I I've completely changed how how I live my life um in terms of people that uh you know I look up to or 
you know, mentors or, 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 or however you want to say it, you know, I started writing again uh, the summer of 2010 and, you know, I, I started reading a lot of uh, Stephen King. Um, as a child, I was a fan of Hitchcock. Um, and I also found a lot of, people think this is strange, but I found a lot of inspiration in um, some 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 very talented hip hop artists like, uh, you know, whether it's Tupac or Biggie or, or Eminem. And I was, and to this day, I still am. I'm blown away how Eminem can tell a story in eight bars. Um, yeah. And I know exactly how he's feeling. I know what it looks like. I know everything about it and he does it in eight bars and I'm just like, wow. Um, you know, like that, that would take me a whole chapter yeah. to, to do. Um, so, you know, it was just, it was this constant, um, diligence of, you know, just staying sober, living a small life, listening to music, going to meetings, talking to other alcoholics and writing every day and trying to be the best father that I could. And slowly, but surely it kind of, um, put me in a position where where I could, you know, pitch a book. I love that distinction that you shared between happiness and serenity because it really does, again, it expands that definition of what our real goal is, you know. I right. remember, I remember one time hearing from, uh, from a, a mentor of mine about the different, it, it's similar thread of what you're describing, but little different words. It was saying, you know, don't seek for happiness, seek for joy. You know, there's a different, like happiness, right. if you break it apart, it's it's a combination of pleasure and joy. And depending on which side of the of that, you know, aisle you're, you're seeking for, you're gonna get it, but it's not gonna be lasting. And that by seeking for a you know, literal joy, like feeling joyness being ha like having that be your happiness it's it's a different feeling i find it you know th there's languages across our globe that you know have several words for happiness have ways to break down that and for some reason in english ours are a lot less you know we're more limited <laughs> in how we describe right. it right. and it is powerful I, I i love that distinction though serenity paints such a a great picture about you know what do we really look for to me serenity is calmness it's yep. certainty it's uh, patience. It's it's peace. yeah. It's peace. Yeah. It's it's this kind of your you know the 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 ocean might be crashing and there might be thirty foot swells, but you know you're fifteen feet below all that and it's quiet and it's you know, peaceful and you're you're good. You're not drowning. You're just yep. you know, submerged in it and it's it's and it's great. You know what else is really helping with that is um, life references and and what I mean by that is um, I can now look back at my life and 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 pinpoint you know four or five moments where at the time you know i was convinced this is the worst thing this is worst possible outcome scenario whatever like disaster my life is over moments and now i look at them and i see them as gifts yeah and and now that like i know that it makes some of the bad days easier, not easier to deal with, but an understanding that, okay, today is not my day, but that does not mean, you know, that the rest of my life is, is, is over. Um, so, so that has really helped me um, just kind of process, you know, when, when, when shit does go bad. Um, I know I'm resilient. I know I can come back. I know, um, you know, I've got some fight left in me and, and there's some hustle. And, and if I continue to be positive and continue to work hard, that everything will be okay. And I'm sorry if, if we're getting too, uh, <laughs> too hokey here. I apologize. I wanted to take a quick minute and thank the sponsors of this show. Brahma Lending and Gnarly Nutrition. As far as Brahma Lending is concerned, I get a kick out of it when I can see businesses that are, their sole purpose is to help other businesses to stay in business. And what I mean by that is that Brahma Lending is a lending solutions company. If you're a small business or established business and you need anything financial when it comes to working capital, you need to purchase new equipment, finance your accounts receivable, or also known as a factoring loan, you wanna buy a new company, Brahma Lending has solutions and options that will help you. 
Now they're not like a normal bank or credit union that only lends based on credit worthiness. Brahma has relationships with dozens of lenders throughout the entire United States. They can take your weird shape and find the perfect box for it when it comes to your lending solutions. So what you need to do, they've made it easy. Go to morelendingoptions.com. Morelendingoptions.com, take two minutes, fill out the short form, and a representative of their company will get in touch with you and see what you can do. Now, as far as gnarly nutrition is concerned, these guys are the bee's knees, man. I started using their supplements in my own training, and I was noticing that as soon as I did after that, my results started to peak in a way that they hadn't before. What you put in your body, both pre and post workout, is huge when it comes to the results you're gonna get. And Gnarly Nutrition provides BCAAs, whey protein, pre workout powders, meal replacements, all with non GMO organic ingredients. These guys are great. So if you'd like to get your own stash, head to gonarly.com. All right, welcome back, second segment. Thanks for your candidness, uh, attorney. This has been really, uh, really fun to, to get underneath it. In that last segment, you, you said, you know, if we're getting too hokey, <laughs> forgive. We're not, man. There, there's a, there's something to be said for some of the unspoken things about life and how we live it and, and, uh, how our emotions affect our decisions and, you know, mindset and all that, that are really important. It's, it's not just this, you know, random coincidences that are stringed together that make up our life. We do have a say in uh, how we choose to react if, if anything to our experiences. And uh, there's power in that, you know, like yes. like I heard you talk about, you know, you, the most horrible days where you thought there was no more bottom you could go, like you realized that you were going to be okay and that it was going to yep. work. And, and I think that anybody that's listening to this specific interview knows that they've had those same experiences where the sky is falling, chicken littles running around warning everybody that this is the end. And then all of a sudden the sun rises again tomorrow and you're like, well, wait a sec, I thought it was done. But so thanks for your candidness there. This is, uh, this is great. I want to talk about your book some more and your creative process, the things that have have uh, really allowed you to take what's inside and to give them a form that's outside of you, so to speak. And you've my understanding is you've written two books, three books. Like you've got a you've ghost written one, and you have the buy side. And then if I remember right, you've got another one coming out soon. Is is that accurate? Um. Well, everything but coming out soon. <laughs> okay. um, Fair I'm. I'm in the midst of working on a proposal um, for a Navy SEAL, and uh, it's 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 an incredible story. Um, so I'm I'm uh, I'm hopeful that everything will go smoothly, and um, we'll we'll get a deal. I'm 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 very confident we'll get a deal. Um, I just don't know when the book will be out. So provided that goes the way you want, are you in the position of biographer at that point? Um, so the way, the way I presented it, um, I said to, to, to their group, I said, you know, I did, I did a second book and I was a ghostwriter and that was fine and all, but career wise, um, I need my name on the cover, not, not for ego purposes, but just, you know, I can't have five years go by from, from the buy side and people would be like, you know, what happened to that guy? Um, so I said, you know, I want the book by so-and-so with Turney Duff and uh, they, they seemed okay with it. So, Well, I wish you the best on that. Let us uh, keep in touch with us and let us know how that goes. I'd love to hear about it. Definitely. So let's, let's talk about the buy side. Uh, as you had shared at the beginning of our first segment, this, you know, it's a, it's a tale of, uh, of intrigue. It's, it's uh, autobiographical. It's, uh, you know, as, as true as you could remember it to be, I'll say. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> It's a it's a really great read. When when did you decide to take that pen to paper? You so have- I got out of my second rehab, drug and alcohol rehab, um, in November of two thousand nine. I was trying to sort out my life. I'm living in a house that was going to be foreclosed upon. Um, I knew I didn't didn't want to go back to Wall Street, and um, I was kind of trying to figure figure my life out and. You know, I, I went to like a medical hypnosis guy. I went to um, a therapist. I went to, you know, AA meetings. I, I was getting a massage. I was going to a movie once a week. Like I was just trying to to to, to stay sober. And I ended up um, meeting or, or going to see a creative life coach. And after our first meeting, she challenged me. She said, I want you to write three times for 30 minutes this week and – um, you know, we'll, 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 we'll meet next Wednesday and, you know, I'll read your stuff or whatever. 
And I was like, all right, I can do that. The first night I, I went home and I said, all right, I got to write for 30 minutes. And I started writing, looked up and it was two hours later. Um, I walked in her office a week later and I'd written all seven nights and, um, you know, over an hour each night and something clicked. It was like, you know, this, this thing that I've been chasing my entire life when, with, with money and drugs and sex and pornography and power and, and all of that, that I was never able to fill writing kind of started to, to fill that void. And so, you know, I knew I was onto something. And, uh, so I ended up writing a book, a novel in the summer of 2010, which I still have, I haven't figured out what I'm going to do with it or if I can do anything with it. Um, but, uh, you know, fast forward to the spring of 2011, uh, I'm sitting there one night and, and I'm kind of, you know, saying to myself, I need to do something. I need to get published. I need, I need, I just need to do something, um, to, to help me with, with my novel. And I had, I had this moment, I guess, where I, I, I kind of realized if you took an S&P chart um, from 1994 to 2009 and you laid it down and then you took a chart of my own life, um, they look eerily similar, very, very <laughs> similar. You know, like I showed up in New York City in 94 and the market was kind of plugging along and all of a sudden I get this huge break in, in 99, you know, right as the dot-com boom and the, and the market took off and – you know, I switched hedge funds around 2001, you know, with September 11th. And it was kind of, you know, my career flattened off a little bit. And then it took off again. And I ended up collapsing, you know, the same moment as the entire world was collapsing. And I felt like there was something there. And so I sat down to write and I ended up writing 20 pages in, in one night. And I ended up emailing like 20 friends and, and it got passed around two days later a literary agent called me and she said, I was dropping my, my daughter off at school and someone said, Hey, you need to read this. And she's like, you know, can, can you come into my office and we'll talk about putting a book proposal together? And I said, well, how about this? I said, why don't I write a book proposal and we'll get together in two weeks. And she was like, ha ha. Uh, okay. If you think you can write one in two weeks <laughs> and literally the next 10 days, that's all I did. Um, other than, you know, see my daughter. And it felt like I, I hit send on my computer and I, and I swear to God, it felt like I hit send and then the phone rang. She was like, get in here now. Um, and so that's kind of how it all started. Um, you know, so it wasn't necessarily a book um, in my head. It was just me writing and, and just, you know, kind of telling my story in, uh, in, in, in 20 pages. And uh, um, that's kind of how it all started. And, and since then, you know, thankfully, I I haven't had to work a day since. That's so great, man. I I uh, I love hearing that 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 was your experience. I'm I'm somewhat of a budding writer myself, and I get these blocks. I don't know exactly what to write, and and your story is the perfect blend of you know writing some sort of self development handbook, if you will, versus writing a fiction story. And, uh, you know, yours is both in a way. And, uh, it just was, you know, you basically just had to <laughs> narrate your own memory. Well, you know, you know, it's interesting cause you made a comment earlier. Um, and I was going to say something, but I didn't want to disrupt the flow. Um, and you were talking kind of how, how I ended up writing the book and, um, what, I mean, a lot of it's self-taught, but it's, it's interesting the way you described it because that's kind of what I was trying to do. I was trying to write it like a movie, yet it was my life. Um, so I got you into a scene and I got, you know, told you what you needed to know and I got you out. But there were yeah. moments and, and I call them uh, my Morgan Freeman voice. And <laughs> yes. those those are the moments where I feel like I am the narrator of my own story. And, and, and the piece that you read is when I feel like, OK, now now is time for the Morgan Freeman voice. Yeah. Um, so I was glad that you, you, you kind of caught on to that. Yeah. It's, it, well, it, those are the most impactful parts of the story, really. I mean, I don't give a shit if you went to a bar on a, or where you lived and tried Becker and that stuff. It's, it's, it's the, it's the, those reflective moments in your book 
that really just kind of hammer home like, okay, so this is why all that stuff is important. It's like, oh, okay, I get right. it now. Well, you know what was, what, what was tough for me with that? Um, so I wrote in first person present tense, right? Sure, yeah. So when, when I was reflecting, let's say, after walking home from, you know, a mature escort's apartment, right? I told myself I could really only reflect on Turney at that moment. You know what I mean? Yeah. I cheated sometimes a little bit, but like, um, I, I don't know if cheating is the right word, but I really tried to not write it in the sense of a, you know, 42 year old attorney looking back on a 29 year old attorney. You know what I mean? Sure. Cause I thought it, it had to be honest. So you know, I wasn't necessarily always calling out my bad behavior. Well, it, it plays like that too. I, I I know there's a couple times like where I noticed that where I I actually in from the vantage point of a writer saw like, man, that's really good how we put that together. But I'm still enthralled in the story. I mean, there was another part where uh, I'm trying to remember the specifics where I, I think it was on an allocation you were supposed to get and, and then it didn't happen and you were trying to figure it out and, and you were angry and you're like, fuck these guys. Like, and, but yet you still had those Morgan Freeman voices in that, but it was specific to the recollection of, you know, that time of where you were at in that. And it, right, it, it was, right. it was powerful in how it came across because it felt really authentic. And, uh, I, you know, not that this needs to be the <laughs> review of the buy side, but I, I like that we're we're going this route because from the standpoint of creating a narrative as a writer, that's really important to maintain that sort of authenticity. You can't have this, you know, 60 year old prophetic prose come right after, you know, you're talking about doing lines of blow like it just doesn't. Right. Work. <laughs> you, you know, what's interesting about that is um, so for 40 years of my life, um, I've always made decisions based on how many friends will I win? How many friends will I lose? Should I do this? Everything was sort of motivated from I wanted people to like me. I wanted, you know, I wanted to win people over. I wanted to show people my best my best side um, because it was just so important to me. And, and obviously, you know, I know now that it was a huge insecurity. But when I, when I wrote the book, I said to myself, I'm like, okay, you got – you got, you know, this dude with a waspy name from a small town in Maine who made millions of dollars on Wall Street and he's a drug addict, right? So it's like boo-hoo. So I said to myself, I go, you know what? I go, at no point am I ever going to try to get the reader like me because if I do, um, it'll just be an instant turnoff. So I actually leaned the other way and said, not that I was trying to get you to not like me, but I, but I was like, I'm not going to... I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to say, hey, well, you know, I raised $25,000 for this charity and, you know, I'm really a good guy. Like, you know, I just told the truth. And and the one of the biggest gifts I have received um, from, from writing this book is the, you know, I was shocked at the overwhelming, you know, sort of response of, of how many people are rooting for me during, during, during the book. And, and 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 appreciate my honesty and and what I learned from that was you know I would rather you not like me um, than than for you to uh, like me but me only show you like my best self if that makes sense yeah absolutely it it, yeah. it does play that way too I mean there's that old phrase that says your mess is in your message yes and yes. Uh, it's it's true like I I found myself kind of looking at the things as I'm reading your book and I'm experiencing this, I, I looking at the things that you were doing that were, you know, either suspect or outright illegal or wrong or whatever. And there was this caveat in my mind, I'm like, well, yeah, I do the same thing. I get it. <laughs> and then the things where it was, you know, where you, you drew a line and where it was an important integrity play, I'd be like, good. That's, that's what he should have done there. So it was, it was this, this interesting balance about the humanity of living in that environment that really, I think is what allows the readers to connect to your story because you make no qualms about the fact that you did what you did. You're very open about it. I won't spoil anything for people that are going to go read this that haven't read it, but you're, you're very open. I mean, alarmingly open in a good way, but at the same time, like there is, there is that humanity there about you do care for people and you care for yourself in a weird way. And you have, you know, this kind of manner that, that goes about trying to make sure that, you know, 
The reason why you want people to like you, I think, is because ultimately you like you, even if you have a hard time admitting it to yourself. <laughs> right. So, yeah. Okay. yeah. Uh, wait, I'm sorry. I, I have a question for you. Sure, it's, yeah. it's, it's It's an interesting concept that uh, I think most people, n- not you, just from our brief encounter, but um, because, you know, we have had some some similar experiences. But I always find it interesting um, to ask people if they think their morality is set by their limitations. You know what I mean? So, um, and, and I don't mean to sound rude, but like, you know, some some guy who is, let's say, has has a very, you know, high set of morals, um, perhaps isn't being hit on by very attractive women or has, you know, millions and millions of, of dollars. And I'm not saying this is universal, but I always kind of think it's interesting. Sometimes I think people's morals are set by their limitations. If that does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. I I fully agree with that. I, well, I guess limitations not, not, sounds wrong. Yeah, I I think I understand the essence of what you're you're asking. Is that right. the the being tested on what your morality is is set by your limitations? I think. Yeah, that's. That's that's a great way to put it. Every, everybody can say to themselves, oh, I'm a good person. I would never do this and everything. And, and anytime I hear that sort of rhetoric out of somebody's mouth, I, I don't ever believe it because it's something that as an individual, you can never say that you can predict how you will act in certain situations because there's so many other varying factors around what happens when you get into that situation that could affect that that just chip away. You can have the most, you know, distinguished resolve ever that you're, you know, this strong moral character guy, you would never, ever do this. And then chip, 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 different things happen. Next thing you know, you know, you're in, you're unfaithful to your wife, you're cheating on your taxes, you're doing, you know, all the different things that can come by justifying it, that it's okay because of, you know, this specific scenario. Um, That's just a hundred percent. Right. And, and I remember some guy was, or, was coming after me, um, like, you know, my character, um, and, and kind of saying, you know, like, oh, he was working at Galleon when, you know, in 1999 and, you know, he didn't blow the whistle and blah, 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 blah. And, and I'm just like, dude, like (laughs) I was, I was 29 years old. The entire world was getting rich and like, it was the way that 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 Wall Street was operating at the time. Like, no, I wasn't going to you know, put my foot down and, and go march downtown. And I'm sorry, I just I'm not that strong, you yeah. know, but like somebody, you know, kind of reflecting back, being like, I should have done that. It's like you, you don't get it. It reminds me, actually, I don't know if you're a fan of Bill Burr's comedy, but uh, he has this bit where he talks about how. The uh, the wife beaters of <laughs> the wife beaters on the female side are gold digging whores, and how <laughs> <laughs> that there's an epidemic in our country that these women are getting away with it and, and, and nobody's saying anything. And he brings up an example of Arnold Schwarzenegger, and he's like, "Why did that guy fuck that maid in his bed? That was a layup." <laughs> he's like, he grows up getting famous for lifting weights, moves to a different country, becomes a movie star when they can't even understand what he says. From there, he marries the country's royalty and a Kennedy gets voted a, a governor in a state he can't even pronounce. He's like, how many lifetimes would it take you to do something like that? And you're going to judge that guy because of what he did? Give me a fucking break, man. Right. And he exactly. does it under the, you know, the idea of it being a bit, but it, it, it's, it goes right in with what we're talking about with this question. It's like, you know, limitations can... If you've never... If you've never really succeeded in a financial level, for some reason, money means, seems to be this this barrier. When when you have right. access to money, where it's more than just some of your wants and your needs, but you actually like have the luxury and you don't have to worry about. I mean, when, when you're when you're legitimately wealthy, all of a sudden things come in that you could never anticipate before. A hundred percent. And and this might not be the right example, but like, you know, if you would have asked twenty five year old self or me um i would have in a million years never done cocaine i would have never called an escort like i i thought like calling an escort was so like what a loser like you can't get a chick like and then all of a sudden i'm like 33 make a million dollars a year you know blows flying up my nose and i was like calling an escort's 
awesome. Like <laughs> so easy. <laughs> you're right. You don't pay them to come. You pay them to leave. Right. And and I'm like, this is this is amazing. I'm like, yeah, I, I can get a girl at the bar, but why would I want to? Um, you know, I don't do that anymore. But like, you know, everything changed when my bank account changed. Yeah. Which which is a it, it makes me respect more the climb back up than you know the actual staying there. Like it, it seems like anybody that's making a lot of money like that, no matter who you are, what you everybody it seems has their their fall. Or like they're yeah. like fuck, I can't handle this anymore, and then they do destructive things that bring them back to you know a zero basis to use a, <laughs> a yeah. financial term, yeah. and and then you figure it out like that. That same thing happened to me, you know, two thousand eleven, two thousand twelve. I'm sitting here looking at my life, going, this is not what I wanted. Right? Is it worth it? And then realizing that you know, I'll tell you what, I still have aspirations for for that fuck you money. I still want that, but it's going right. to look different now. And if I don't get there, I don't care because the other things are going to be in line anyway. And so I even went through these exercises where I was like, so how much does it take to live like a billionaire? Like, you know, everybody has this, they want to be a billionaire. Billionaire is a big, you know, catch word. Right. You know? And it's like, well, you could rent a billionaire's lifestyle between eight to 10 million a year. So, okay, eight to 10 million. That's a number that's, you know, it's not that out of reach when it comes to certain, you know, right. real estate endeavors. And, it, and then what it brought back is like, well, why would I want all that headache? I don't need to own all that shit. I don't need that. It just, it was this really interesting exercise to go like, well, what, what, what's really important? Like, do I right. need people to think I'm cool? Like, is, is that what it is? Like, I, I've noticed that now anytime, especially in the, the market today, I've, I've got other businesses that I'm a part of now. And and uh, one of the things that scare me the most are expensive cars and watches. Now, I walk into a, a meeting with somebody and they've got their Ferrari keys and their, you know, their $30,000 watch. It makes me wonder, like, okay, so what is the priority here? Right. Not, right. To, not to judge in a bad way, but it just is one of those things where having been that guy that I, I wanted you to see my watch in my car and, and uh, you know, know who my host was at the win. And, and you know, it, it was a story because I was empty inside. My, yep. Who I yep. really was, I was scared to have people know. I totally relate and and something that kind of encapsulates everything that you and i have talked a little bit about um game changer for me and, and it's taken it's taken many many years and i still struggle um you know i i came from wall street which is a very results oriented you know industry and uh, my entire life has been about results um you know i sometimes would spend more time figuring out what I needed, like what score I needed to get on my next chemistry test, you know, so I could maintain my B average. Um, and so my entire life has been about results and I've been able to make a shift over the last five years. And I, I own, well, I try to only care about my action and, and it's, it's strange and, and there's something magical about it. But when, when I'm true to that and when I really only focus on my actions, strangely the the results don't matter as much um you know so if if i'm interviewing for a job and you know the the, the old attorney would have um uh, you know sat there up at night and figured out like you know who, who can i have call and how am i going to do this and um oh my god like i have to get the job if i don't get that job like everything's going to be horrible and blah 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 blah, blah. And, and i would spend all of this time and energy on on worrying about you know the, the result and um, now I, I really just try to focus on, okay, what, what can I do to put myself in the best position to get this job? All right. I can, I can study this. I can be prepared for the, this, for the interview. I can call these three people and, and they can make a reference and I can, you know, I can walk in there and, and nail the interview. And when I walk out, it doesn't matter if I get the job or not. And I know that sounds like, like bullshit, but but I it works and it's it's completely changed my life. So I really don't care about the results anymore. Yeah, that doesn't sound bullshit at all. I I've you know I, I hired a, a lifestyle coach not too long ago, and one of the things that has been a help to me is right along those lines. It's like, how about we have there be a daily list of things that you measure yourself against that you are committed to and that you execute as opposed to what those things will bring you. You know, don't put the success or failure on, you know, what the outcome is. It's on whether you do it or not. And it's really changed my outcome on a lot of uh, my, my output and my outcome in a lot of things in a really helpful way. Cause it's like, I'm unattached now to the result. And the irony is that my results are better than they've ever been. So it's, yeah, I, 
Totally agree. Anyway, turning it out of respect to your time, I, I we need to wrap this up soon. I know you, you told me you needed to bail out of here, but I, I wanted to give you one last thing. What's the best way for the listeners of Rules of Success to reach out to you, to to be involved with your story and your book and to, and to follow along with your career now? Um, so I, I do have a website. It's tourneyduff.com, T-U-R-N-E-Y-D-U-F-F.com. Um, I'm on Facebook. I'm on Twitter. Um, you know, I try to try to respond to everyone because, you know, if anyone's willing to take the time to, to reach out to me, you know, I'm, I'm going to reach out to them. So, um, you know, I, I love interacting with, with people who, who have read my book or identified with anything that, that I've said. And, um, you know, I, I, I kind of look at my, my new career is, uh, I don't know where I'm going and where I'm going to end up. And that's, that's a beautiful thing. So, um, I'm really, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you had me on and, you know, hopefully we'll, uh, we'll continue to talk. Absolutely, man. Well, I appreciate your time. Like you said, go to tourneyduff.com. There'll be a link in the, when you pick up your phone and you, and you touch the image on your podcast app, it'll flip over and there'll be some cheat sheet notes there. There'll be a link for Tourney Duff as well as at Tourney Duff is his Twitter handle. I know that from personal experience. And uh, go check out the buy side, people. It seriously is a great read. It's it's this interesting blend between, you know, the the craziness of Wall Street and and this guy's kind of coming of age cautionary tale of of watching one decision chip away and chip away, and next thing you know, you're you're left in a place that is really tough to get out of. So, <laughs> thank you for your candidness and, and your time, Tony. Truthfully, it's it's Thanks, been uh, it's been a joy. Like I'm I'm really excited to, to keep in touch with you after this and. Uh, Definitely. Cheer you on from a distance. (laughs) You too. Anyway, man. All right. Thank you. Hey, what's going on, everyone? It's Trent Outson, a.k.a. Sixth Sense. Thanks for tuning in to the Rules of Success podcast. Next week, join us again for another ride. In the meantime, make sure to reach out to us on social media. To tweet our host directly, try at I am Mr. Prescott or check out our website at rulesofsuccess.us. Until next time, take it a day at a time.